I'm doing great. How are you, Alex? Good. Nice to connect. Uh, I think we've followed each other on social media for some time. It's uh, nice to put a face to the name and the voice. Likewise. Exciting times at Intel. Maybe you could introduce yourself again to, to me and the folks who are watching. Sure. Yeah, it is uh, definitely uh, exciting times. You know, lots of industry transitioning happening at this time. Um, so I'm Alex Quash, and I'm the uh, I'm a vice president and general manager of the uh, wireline and uh, core network division um, at Intel. And this division sits inside the data platforms group. Uh, and so we're responsible for the data center business. Uh, but then within that data center business, um, we have a, a fast growing uh, business within the network, the networking sector. Well, exciting times to be in the core network evolution business. When I started my career in telecom, probably 25 years ago, a central office with a, th a thing that sat in a big brick building. And, right. you know, it was sort of isolated with guards and gates and locks and keys and and so right. tell me, you, you know, the core network has evolved and is, the evolution's accelerating. Um, what's top of mind now as you roll out 5G globally? Yeah, so top of mind definitely is 5G. Uh, you know, 5G still holds the promise of transforming our lives collectively, I think, over the next decade. Um, and if you look at the way the, the 5G network is, uh, is evolving, um, the first wave of 5G implementations actually started with the radio access network uh, back in 2018, 2019. And uh, just to take advantage of the, the new spectrum that's being allocated for 5G, right? So super fast bandwidths with new spectrum. And then uh, following very quickly, the new radio access network is the new 5G core network. And, and so uh, what we're seeing is in the 2020 timeframe, is really when the new 5G core network gets installed, gets deployed. And then over the next two to three years and beyond 2020 is when we see a ramping of these deployments. So I think according to a survey by um, IHS, 20% um, uh, of the service providers surveyed by IHS actually planned deployment in 2020, and then another 47% um, in 2021. So I think service providers around the world who are implementing 5G networks are doing are uh, deploying the 5G core networks roughly to the tune of 67 to 70 percent over the next two years. Uh, and these core networks essentially deploy a, a new architecture, a services based architecture that is much more cloud friendly that I would say is actually running on cloud native environments when they're fully up and running. Uh, and that's uh, that's a big change. Uh, it's a big change for the entire industry. And you mentioned something that was uh, that's really interesting and, and quite amusing is that the central offices that, that you were referring to, right, in buildings that are under lock and, and whatnot, they're going through a major transformation as well because the 5G core network, um, and you typically think of the, the core as something that's residing in the, the telco data center, portions of that core network are actually moving into the central office uh, be to be able to uh, respond to... Um, and address new 5G services that are coming in that require lower latencies. So um, these uh, core networks are getting closer and closer to the 5G enabled devices, whether these devices are phones, cars, things, you know, whatever they may be. Yeah, exciting times. My first 5G device arrived yesterday in the mail, so I'll be connecting uh, today. Um, and, and I'm right. wondering, will I be connecting to a 5G core here, here in Boston that's you know, a bolt-on to, to an existing network? You know, might it be a standalone core? Like, how, is, how are carriers rolling out 5G in, in the core of the network right now? And how do you see, you know, Intel, you know, sort of uh, helping them evolve to a, a pure 5G infrastructure? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, for the most part, um, the vast majority of service providers, uh, if not all service providers, um, are rolling out uh, 5G with a 4G or LTE core network. So they're using a, f a new 5G base stations, right? They can take advantage of the, the new 5G spectrum right. and air, air interfaces, hence the phone that, that you got. And I'm really curious to hear what, what you think of your, your new 5G service. I want you yeah, I'm, I'm excited to try it out. Yeah, and I'll be, yeah. I travel a lot, so I'll be getting all kinds of low band, mid band, high band right. you know, networks. But uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting times. 
Yeah, so these networks are going to get rolled out with a new 5G radio access network, but the core network is mostly going to be uh, today rolled out in what we call a non-standalone or an NSA mode. So 5G radio base stations connecting to an LTE core network. And when I mentioned about the transition in 2020 and 2021, that's going to move to a standalone or an SA core uh, where in 2020, some leading service providers are going to be rolling out their standalone network, um, you know, throughout the next two to three years. So the patterns we're seeing is new radio access to networks, new base stations on 4G core, and then the 4G core transitions to a 5G core starting in 2020. Yeah, it's exciting times. And I imagine what Intel is really driving with its new announcements on the silicon and the platform and the software side is really price performance and functionality, right? To move to that true 5G end-to-end -end core. Uh, can, can you highlight some of the, you know, unique yeah. positioning that you guys just announced recently? Yeah, no, this is, this is uh, really great stuff because, you know, when we looked at the, at the core network, the core network started its uh, network transformation journey, if you will, back in 2013, seven years ago already, right? Um, you know, NFV, the whole network function virtualization, that, that movement started right after the LTE networks, the initial LTE networks were put in place. And the network function virtualization movement, um, Evan, if you, if you recall, uh, was really about uh, driving faster innovation, decoupling hardware from software, uh, and having a broader ecosystem of solution vendors available for service providers, right? To, to drive faster innovation, to have better uh, total cost of ownership, et cetera. Um, Intel led that, that uh, NFV movement and really was able to introduce um, these communication servers um, in the NFV space so that all of these network functions that used to run in proprietary uh, black boxes, if you will, um, now became software functions uh, decoupled from the hardware and the hardware uh, really are uh, communication based uh, communication servers, right? Enterprise servers that are optimized for the communication workloads. And that movement's really improved, you know, generation on generation, year on year, uh, to the point where I think in 2020, um, a report by Del Oro is reporting um, that the core networks are now 50% virtualized. Uh, in 2020, uh, and Intel is essentially, you know, the de facto um, underlying silicon provider for the servers that that are uh, powering these virtualized networks. And um, these virtualized networks are expected to grow to over 80% by 2024, all accelerated by 5G. Uh, and um, with underlying, um, you know, Intel Silicon um, inside these, uh, these servers, uh, while Intel continues to drive and contribute to standards um, such as DBDK in the, within the context of the Linux Foundation, uh, as well as uh, working with a broad ecosystem to continue um, delivering on the, on the promises of, of uh, NFV moving to cloud native and then delivering to, to 5G. Yeah, what an exciting time to be a developer or a, a network builder or an OEM. How far outside of the core do you think Intel will play? I mean, right to the edge in terms of uh, various endpoints and uh, edge networking devices and routers and, and uh, other kinds of, of innovative devices uh, that might sit in the enterprise or you know, the, the car or other places. Wow. Yeah, that's just, uh, you know, that, that whole end to end, um, you know, network right outside of devices, uh, is really a space that Intel is, is, um, continuing to grow. I think in the context of, um, you know, outside of the core now and looking at the radio access network in, in, uh, February, we talked about, we just launched some new products, right. Including a new Atom chipset for, uh, for the, the radio access network. And um, Intel is actually making its way into, into base stations. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've said that um, by 2021, uh, we'll have roughly 40% market segment share of the, the base station market. So that's one edge. But then another edge that's really exciting for developers, for OEMs, for service providers, and for cloud service providers um, is the edge for um, compute and artificial intelligence. So with your 5G uh, enabled phone, hopefully you're going to be able to run a number of different applications, uh, you know, services, and all the packets that your phone are going to generate uh, to go back into the network 
you know, traditionally these packets, these, these data packets will travel all the way back to a main data center, you know, located hundreds if not thousands of miles away from where you are. With this, these edge compute uh, capabilities that are emerging at the network edge now, um, your data is gonna get processed, analyzed and dispositioned and returned to you in a much, much faster um, uh, way, right? With much less time. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of artificial intelligence and computing and storage um, at this growing edge. So think of these central offices uh, that are closer to where you are now, and then moving into the base station cell sites, you know, there'll be computing and artificial intelligence and storage and, and networking capabilities at these sites with growing edge compute capabilities uh, that Intel and, and our partners are going to be delivering uh, so that, you know, you and I and, you know, cars and, um, you know, God knows what in terms of, uh, you know, Internet of Things devices are going to be able to just transmit data and have the data get processed. A lot of video data in the short term. Yeah, it's exciting times. I'm, I'm talking to a local Boston company that's building uh, essentially a, a, a balloon or drone as an edge device uh, that for right. remote computer uh, communities and rural communities will deliver high speed data in places where there aren't cell phone towers or, or local coverage. So what an exciting time for developers yeah. to kind of leverage uh, all this this technology you've built. And you actually have a program designed for developers and network builders, right? It sort of nurtures the almost an ecosystem of companies that are building around your products? Yeah, we have a, a, a community. So part of um, sort of, you know, decoupling hardware from software, you know, part of taking apart what were these proprietary black boxes that, that came in the past in these network function devices um, was, you know, to be able to have, you know, different components uh, be identified separately and then have an ecosystem of solution providers at each level and then driving standard interfaces at each level so that they can operate, right? Putting them back together is also a challenge. And that's really what slowed down the adoption of NFV between 2013 and you know, 2018, 2019. And so um, it's really critical to have um, a, a number of solution providers come together and then have some what we call solution recipes, uh, reference designs, if you will, so that we know that we can test specific components together and service providers can actually deploy these solutions with peace of mind because they know that these configurations have been tested and validated and, and work well. Uh, and so in the context of the Intel Network Builders Program, we have software vendors, uh, OSVs, operating systems, hardware vendors, uh, OEM vendors, solution vendors come together to look at um, it, recipes that Intel has put together across the entire solution stack so that these solutions can be tested and validated uh, and, and installed with, with peace of mind. That's fantastic. I mean, interoperability and time to market is key. And you're sort of taking a lot of the workload off the uh, desk of, of the uh, OEMs. I'm also, as a former EE, fascinated by this technology. It's 10 uh, my, uh, micron silicon that you're, you know, you know coming out with. Uh, is it onwards and upwards yeah. from there? I mean, we're continuing, uh, you know, to see innovation from Intel on the manufacturing technology and putting more functionality on chip. Uh, I, I thought Moore's law had, had ended. That's what yeah. all the press were saying in the last uh, couple of years. So yeah. that doesn't seem to be quite the case. Yeah, we don't quite see that. We see Moore's law is actually, you know, pretty pretty well and live and um, you know we're transitioning from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer to you know the next node is going to be a seven nanometer transition right uh, and so you know that that just uh, that that law is well and live and you know generation and generation we invest in processor technology mm -hmm. and um, the processor that we just announced um, I think was last week or two weeks ago in the 24th um, that that is actually powering a lot of the core networks is uh, our um, Intel uh, Xeon scalable processor, mm -hmm. uh, second generation, uh, and and it, and that that processor is um, you know what's been I think we just announced a um, a, a published a, a white paper um, with a company uh, called ZTE, mm -hmm. uh, where we've uh, just uh, were able to establish uh, fantastic uh, performances for the core network, uh, upwards of uh, 200 gigabits per second per server. 
um, using using uh, these uh, Intel second generation uh, Xeon scalable processors, and that capability is is still provides a lot of headroom for the type of traffic that you see today. Um, so that it has a lot of headroom still for growth uh, for tra for 5G traffic uh, as 5G continues to, to gain foothold, and we anticipate greater traffic in the network as a result of 5G. Fantastic. Well, despite missing each other at Mobile World Congress, sadly, uh, it's great sadly. to see the, the, the innovation hasn't uh, paused at all at Intel. So thanks for the update and the insights, and I'll be watching yeah. for more and, and more news. One, one, one thing, you know, that we didn't, we didn't talk about is, you know, these are commercial solutions that are now achieving 200 gigabits per second. Intel wow. last year, uh, we demonstrated at Mobile World Congress in, uh, in 2019, when we were still in Barcelona together, uh, 200 gigabits per server for the core network, right? And, um, you know, the, the, the perform that type of performance is, is really critical. And what Intel does is we try and set the bar for what's possible to run on these communication server technology. And then we work with uh, the ecosystem, solution vendors like Ericsson, uh, Cisco, uh, ZTE, and we try and optimize, help them optimize their solutions uh, running on, on Intel-based servers. And so shortly after the demonstration of 200 gigabits per server last year in 2019, um, Ericsson published a, a paper um, saying that they were able to achieve 193 gigabits per second. And um, this year, had we been at Mobile World Congress, uh, you would have seen, would have been really proud to show you and to show the world a terabit um, gigabit wow. per second uh, demonstration in the Intel booth. So we'll, we'll make that, that, that demonstration available over uh, a flash demo, um, but uh, live is actually really cool. So, uh, and you know, we hope that you know, in, throughout the rest of 2020, we'll continue working with, uh, with the ecosystem vendors um, and our solution partners uh, to try and get to the next level of, of um, you know, performance bump uh, for the core network. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the appetite for bandwidth and speed and the performance is insatiable. I was at CES this year and, and saw a demo of 8K video from a drone platform. I mean, so there's just no <laughs> end to the need for not just mobility, but bandwidth uh, without, without wires. So I think, right. yeah, the applications are being developed and uh, it, it's an exciting time to be yeah, in the we industry. Need, we server. need eyeglasses and contacts that, that, really, consume, <laughs> that you know, really enjoy the 8K video. Right, right. Well, I, that'll be the next uh, innovation is is uh, is intelligence in your contact lenses. So we'll, we'll wait uh, for for next year to look at that. But thanks so much for your time. Thank I really appreciate. Thank you for your time. Up. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you.